Well, I had to give this uh, talk uh, a couple weeks ago, um, and I gave it to a group of senior citizens who were probably 65 to 70 years old, and uh, they seemed to understand it. So um, I'm working on my PhD, and uh, I've got to be able to visualize it. I've got to keep things simple. Uh, I do have to make a recommend, uh, uh, just uh, recognize somebody in the audience. We have Ray Wiles, who uh, wrote the book here on uh, the nature and properties of soil, which is which actually gave us the inspiration for this, because I, I've seen in here, when we get to that, I'll, I'll point it out. But uh, Rafiq uh, Islam is my advisor. I'm working on my PhD, and Ray was his. So uh, a lot of this information, if I say something wrong, we're going to refer to Ray, because he's kind of the grandfather here. Of this. So we're going to talk about uh, cover crops and phosphorus, and we're going to talk about phosphorus speciation a little bit and some work that we're doing uh, in Ohio on that. So here's uh, Lake Erie, and here's what it looked like in 2011. Uh, 2011, we had a tremendous amount of uh, uh, rainfall. We had twice as much as what we normally did. They said 2010 was a record for the amount of phosphorus that was in Lake Erie, and we totally eclipsed that in 2000. So uh, what's important about this picture is you can see on here there's Cleveland and Toledo and Detroit. Almost 11 million people, 10 to 11 million people get their water from Lake Erie. And uh, all those intakes are right there where this, uh, these harmful algae blooms are occurring. This is cyanobacteria. And I've got another picture here. This shows what it looked like. Uh, this was about uh, 8 inches deep in some places. When the ships physically came in, it physically slowed them down uh, when they came to port. So uh, this is the kind of the walleye capital of the world. Uh, as far as Lake Erie, Lake Erie has 2% of the water, but it has 50% um, uh, of the fish. And so uh, this is having a tremendous impact on tourism. Uh, and on uh, our resources there, our water resources. Um, I'm just going to have you switch to this. Okay, so sorry about that. <laughs> this is the situation in uh, Grand Lake St. Mary's. Um, I work there in Mercer County. We have a tremendous amount of livestock. And uh, you can see uh, these are some of the uh, harmful algae bloom. This is the normal color of that lake just about every single year. It is greener than grass. So we have, uh, this is one of the top livestock producing counties uh, in the Midwest. We're probably in the top uh, uh, two or three counties. So tremendous amount of dairy cattle. We have almost uh, uh, 20 million poultry, turkeys, you name it. We have it in this, this watershed. And so this is a very shallow lake. It's about 12,500 acres. And uh, in 2010, this started with the uh, harmful algae blooms. We had a, some people, we had a totally, uh, could not use the lake because uh, people and dogs were getting sick. We had some, uh, uh, a man had a Labrador re uh, retriever, went into the water. He went to get the dog out. The dog was shaking. It was obviously in distress. The dog died within three hours, and the man now has neurological damage because of the toxins in the water. So this is all due t to uh, phosphorus uh, that is uh, coming off of, of the land from both manure. Here's the situation. This is some data from uh, Heidelberg uh, University. Uh, in the 70s, we were talking about total phosphorus. Now we're talking about soluble reactive phosphorus. We actually made some tremendous gains up until about 1995. And then after 90, 1995, all of a sudden, uh, the, the uh, soluble reactive phosphorus started going up. And so now we're looking at trying to figure out what's going on with that, and uh, we think we may uh, be, be on to something here. So we're going to look at these different forms of uh, phosphorus and crop production. We have the organic forms. Uh, we have both stable and the label forms. Those label would be uh, uh, plan available. Uh, and then we also have these inorganic phosphorus, and uh, we're going to talk about that. We'll show some of the chemistry here uh, a little bit. But in general, if we can keep it in an organic form, it's tied up a little bit tighter than what the, uh, uh, the inorganic forms are So uh, for each, each group. And we'll, we'll take a look at this uh, in a little bit. 
Uh, here shows what we think is going on with uh, phosphorus losses to the environment. With the rainfall, uh, the infiltration, the percolation, we have very heavy clay soils up in northwest Ohio. And so uh, our soils, we're not getting the amount of infiltration. We have a tremendous amount of soil compaction, poor soil structure. And so with soil erosion, we're losing that particulate phosphorus. And then also with that surface runoff, because we, we're getting uh, some of that dissolved phosphorus there. And then that's uh, what's occurring is we're getting this total loss of phosphorus from both the particulate and the dissolved. Uh, we also may be uh, seeing some uh, phosphorus leaching through our soils. Some data from Kevin King has shown that maybe as much as 60% of the phosphorus could be coming from our tile lines. And we think a lot of that is coming from preferential flow. Uh, it's just not being treated. It's coming down a crack in it, uh, or, or some way it's getting into that tile without having a chance to be uh, 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 filtered from the soil. So that's what we're looking at. As we look at our phosphorus efficiency, and I'm going to start to move to some of our demonstrations, phosphorus helps to stabilize the, uh, uh, the clay. Our current phosphorus use efficiency, I've seen a, a number of different estimates, anywhere from 10 to 25, 25 to 50, some of the newer ones, let's assume about 25% efficient. But you'll notice we have the clay, the phosphorus, and the organic matter. So um, I'm going to use this. This green one is uh, phosphorus. You want to hold that? So, uh, what we have is this clay particle, we have this organic matter, and so uh, as we start to lose this organic matter, if we've lost 40 to 50 percent or maybe even more of our organic matter, what happens, this is the particulate phosphorus, and uh, if we put this in water, then this becomes the soluble reactive phosphorus. It will dissociate, and so this is what we're finding in the soil, and so we can actually show you what that chemically looks like. Now, I got this out of Ray's book, and, and I didn't do a very good job. It's really hard to put these together. This is a very strong structure. You'll notice these are, this is a phosphorus. The blue ones are uh, oxygen, and then we have some hydrogen on here. So, so this would be that soluble reactive phosphorus that we're looking at. And uh, let's go to the next one. And let's look at all the different forms of phosphorus when we look at the, the speciation. So we've got this microbial. Uh, phosphorus, and that phosphorus is turned over quite quickly. We have a new definition. I got this from Dr. Uh, um, Dr. Dick, uh, uh, Richard Dick. He says that our bacteria and our microbes in the soil are like soluble bags of fertilizer. Okay, so some of this is tied up in the microbes. We have the soluble reactive phosphorus, and then we have the uh, exchangeable phosphorus, and that's uh, basically the, the active carbon it's tied up, it's in a bigger molecule, so it's probably less likely to, maybe it's going to stay in the soil a little bit longer. And so then we have all these inorganic forms. We have the calcium. And so calcium and magnesium have a 2-plus charge on them. Uh, and uh, you'll notice this is fairly small, and so I can attach this to that calcium. And does anybody know what calcium phosphate is? Does anybody have any on them, maybe? You know, there's, it's in your teeth. It's in your bones. Okay, so this is fairly stable. Then we have what we call the aluminum. And these are oxides. The aluminum and the iron are in the oxide form, uh, although the iron may or may not be. It doesn't have to be. But, uh, and, and so this is a fairly big molecule, and it's very stable. It tends to be fairly stable. We're looking at that. There may be some, uh, even uh, with this next situation, there may be some of it coming out. But the one we're really interested in now is this iron. And so what we're seeing is that this iron is not real stable. It likes to go switch between the F3 state to the F2 state. Okay, and when it does that, under saturated soil conditions, we can lose one of these phosphorus, and this becomes a soluble reactive phosphorus. So that's what we're looking at in some of our studies. And then we have that residual phosphorus. That residual phosphorus, that's going to be tied up probably uh, uh, in, in some of the humus or some of the, the uh, more resistant carbon. So we've got all these different fractions now that we're looking at uh, in the soil. And so here's what happens with the, uh, with the phosphorus. We can see this in the soil. There's some very good pictures. I should have probably put one in there. But in the oxidized state, we're looking at that iron. When this iron 3... Uh, is uh, reduced and goes to iron 2, 
and we can see the color differences that occur with that, we're actually releasing a soluble reactive phosphorus. Now, everybody probably remembers what happens with denitrification. Same thing in some ways, the nitrates are converted to nitrogen gas. So now we're, all of a sudden, now we're starting to do this. And I ran across this in Ray's book a couple years ago, and then I started talking to Rafiq, and now we're starting to look at that uh, in Ohio, and I will, we'll make a couple other uh, uh, references to that in just a little bit. We have manganese that's doing the same thing, and basically the copper. Uh, so uh, we're trying to look at all these different speciations to better understand what's going. So when we look at uh, soluble reactive uh, uh, phosphorus in surface water, we have two factors. We want to know the concentration, but we also want to know that transport factor. So generally what we'll do is we'll take the, the phosphorus concentration times the transport factor to see how many pounds of phosphorus are lost in that surface water. And I'm just going to quote Sharpley on this. He did a very, Andrew Sharpley did a very interesting study. Uh, he had some soils that were extremely high in phosphorus concentration uh, that were a little bit further away from the stream, say about uh, 500 feet. He had some that were about 200 feet and then he, uh, that were medium, and then he had some that were low. And they measured how much phosphorus actually got into the stream. Where do you think most of the phosphorus came from? Actually came from right next to the stream was the highest amount of total phosphorus that was lost. So just because you have a high concentration, it's the transport factor that we're, that we're starting to concentrate on now, looking at how that moves over that landscape. Does that mean that this up higher on the slope didn't get into the stream? Maybe it's just moving down, but at least in their study, they found that the majority of that phosphorus actually came from those areas. His quote is 80% of the phosphorus is coming from about 20% of the land. So that's a key thing. Another uh, sharply quote, 90% of the phosphorus occurs during about the most intense 10% rainfall events. So a key thing we need to do is protect that soil, keep it covered, because we don't know when it's going to rain. And so here's some data that we looked with cover crops. And uh, we took this uh, on uh, some, uh, uh, where we had cover crops, and we looked at all these different fractions. I, this is just part of the data, very small part of them. But look at where we had the soluble reactive phosphorus with the cover crops was 0.34. This was in parts per million or milligrams per liter. Compared to the exchangeable phosphorus was 1.23. And, and uh, where we had the control, which was a conventional tillage, we had 1.42 versus 0.14. So the difference just in the soluble reactive phosphorus is we had four times more of soluble reactive phosphorus in that control. And uh, where we had the cover crops, we had almost nine times more in the uh, exchangeable phosphorus. Now there's another way to look at this. I was just looking at this today we should probably take a ratio of that exchangeable phosphorus to the soluble reactive. If you divide that out, that's a factor of four. If you look at the uh, exchangeable phosphorus in the control compared to the soluble reactive, that's a factor of 0.1. And so there's a tremendous difference in how this phosphorus is being stored uh, in, in the soil or how it's being tied up. We also look at the stratification, and you can see there that it... Uh, uh, we had considerably more of this uh, in that top profile. There is, uh, with the cover crops, uh, it's almost nine times uh, higher than what we did with uh, where we had the control. And uh, with the soluble reactive phosphorus, you can see it's four times higher there uh, where, where we had, uh, had the control. So this is a situation that we're looking at in northwest Ohio, what's happening with our soil structure. This happened an eighth of a mile apart. There was three-quarter inch of rain, very very light amount of rain, but look at the saturation that's occurring on that. These fields, one was a long-term no-till on the left, on the right was a rotational no-till, so just one year tillage. And this was with only three quarters of an inch of rain. In the last couple of weeks, we've had two and three inch rains, and we've had whole fields that are just totally saturated with water. And when that water, especially if that soil structure is very poor, it's gonna run off the soil surface, and it's gonna get into uh, our, our surface, or it may be following a preferential flow and going right down to the tile lines, and we know that about 60% is being lost that way. So that's what we're seeing there. One of the things that we're looking at is this vertical tillage, and uh, um, uh, we were discussing this before. 
with vertical tillage, one of the things that's occurring is now we're starting to see tillage pans about two to three inches deep in the soil. And so what's happening is we're getting less water infiltration. And then now instead of our bucket being, say, six or seven inches deep, now our bucket's only two to three inches deep, and we're seeing a lot more surface pawning. It just seems to be occurring more. We're noticing that, and we're thinking that maybe this could be. And one of the key points is if farmers are working their fields wet in the spring, what's going to happen? I'm going to do this real quick. Um, this is a brick. It has a negative charge. If I put a positive ion in between here, this will set up like a brick wall, okay? And so what's happening is if I put a calcium, magnesium, or uh, potassium in here, this will set up. So what do farmers do when they till the soil and get it extremely fine? It sets up. When we get a rain on it, it gets a very hard crust on it and it gets very dense, and if we have water on there, we'll have less water infiltration. If that's saturated, a lot of that phosphorus can go off. And so that's what we're kind of seeing in our soils. Notice if I put some organic matter in between there, I can cushion that soil, and I can also then trap more nutrients in there with that, that organic matter. So that's real quickly what's going on there. Let's keep moving, because I know we're getting close on time. Here's the uh, things, the benefits of the cover crops. They increase the water infiltration. We think they're moving some of that soluble reactive phosphorus down into the soil profile. We're decreasing the bulk density, increasing the pore space. So probably now we have more room for air and water. If we have more air in the soil, uh, even a little more air, we're probably going to have less of that uh, phosphorus coming available. Uh, or Maybe we can keep it in that F3 state rather than then moving to the F2. And we're also increasing that soil organic matter content, which helps improve that soil structure. And it's going to hold that phosphorus just a little bit tighter. So maybe we can hang on to it. Last slide. Uh, this is what we're seeing with the no-till. Uh, in some cases, uh, this was what they were theorizing anyways, is that the no-till was creating macapores, which are like super highways. They move that water down very quickly through the soil. They were seeing this maybe with earthworms. But where we have the ecological farming, where we're using no-till and cover crops, what's happening is the water goes through the macropore, goes into a micropore, goes into a biopore, slows that water down, allows that to get in deeper into the soil profile, and has time to come in contact with the soil particles. Maybe we can keep some of that phosphorus in the soil. The other thing is these cover crops absorb soluble nitrogen, soluble phosphorus. How much phosphorus do plants grow? Everybody asks me what's the best plant to grow. It all depends on the biomass. 0.2% of most plants is going to be phosphorus. So the more biomass you have, the more phosphorus. But we think maybe more importantly is what it's doing to soil structure, how that's improving that. Maybe that's what has a bigger effect on, on phosphorus management now. So thank you very much. Thank you.